uh, internet and welcome to yet another Hampton Marketing webinar. Uh, we've got kind of a unique situation today where half of us are here in Bloomington, Indiana and the other half is in Virginia. So I think we're going to have a lot of fun today. Quick reminder, there's only about 10 days left until HeroConf 2013 in Austin, Texas. So I'm sure some of you in here are probably attending. Look forward to meeting you and the rest of you. There's only a few days left to register. Today, we're going to be talking about e-commerce marketing, how the best companies and, and how the best companies close the deal. So I'm Jeff Allen. I'm the director of paid search here at Hannapin, frequent blogger at PPC Hero. I'm a grandpa in the internet marketing industry, so I'm going to turn it over to two younger people and probably um, better suited to talk about the topic today. So, Christina, why don't you uh, introduce yourself? Yes, thanks, Jeff. Hi, I'm Christina. I'm one of the account managers at Hannapin, and I have been doing marketing for about six years now, specializing in online marketing for the past three. Cool, and I'm Amanda West Bookwalter. I'm an account manager at Hannapin, frequent blogger at PPC Hero, and I specialize in e-commerce, the topic that we are doing today, so I'm very excited to talk to all of you about it. Perfect. Thanks guys. So um, the topic today, e-commerce optimizations. We're going to go over some interesting statistics that I didn't know and found pretty interesting. Talk about our tips and tricks based on those statistics and make sure that you guys come away with some actionable advice so that you make good use of your uh, lunch hour, at least for us, our lunch hour here. Uh, join the conversation on Twitter at ecom webinar, uh, E-C-O-M webinar. Uh, and we'll make sure that we can respond to the, the tweets that show up there when we're done with the, the webinar today. So the first interesting stat that we're going to talk about here is 61% of consumers say they use a search engine as their primary tool for researching a purchase decision. So this is kind of interesting because it's not just a tool, but their primary tool. Um, so kind of the question this raises, we spend a lot of time on keyword research. One of our insights is that customers don't always search for the keywords you expect. Sometimes that's frustrating. Sometimes you luck out, and it's a, for a good reason. But we're going to have Amanda and Christina talk about some of the tricks for finding those oddball keywords. So I'll let Amanda take it away. Yeah, so one of the first things I think of when I think about um, a tip for finding oddball keywords is some sort of off-the-cuff things, because obviously you have the really... Um, standard practices of keyword tools and, and things like that. But one cool thing that I like to check out um, is, is something from maybe if you have any SEO training you might, you might know about, but it's the view page source on competitor websites. So if you have um, competitors in your space, then you can go to their site and right click the view page source and a lot of times they'll have keywords in there. Um, and I've definitely found some keywords that way that were interesting or ones that I didn't think of. So for this page, I did a search for um, iPads for sale, and so maybe if I was selling iPads, I would look at their keywords and think about um, some of the ones that they have, like daily deals or discounts or sale. Maybe I thought that those were too generic, but seeing a competitor use them might make me more interested in trying them out and seeing how they work. So that's uh, a really cool way to just check out what your competitors are doing and see if you can find some keywords that they've thought of that you haven't. Another one that I like to use is looking at Google Trends um, and then look at the, the rising stats. So for this, um, I put in memory foam mattress. And so let's say I sell memory foam mattresses. Obviously, I probably check this out um, to look at trends, see um, when impressions are up and down. And this is a, a really long time range. We can see impressions are down over this long time range. So that makes finding new keywords all the more important. So maybe I am looking for new keywords and I can see mattress pad is actually a breakout term. So maybe I haven't really thought to advertise on keywords related to mattress pads instead of just memory foam mattresses. So that would be something that I could build out a new campaign for. So um, this is a really cool way to see what the breakout terms are. And a lot of times these are related to news articles that are popular that have to do with what you're selling or what you're trying to um, advertise in PPC for. So it's always really interesting to see what the breakouts are. And Christina, I will let you get on with your tips. Okay, cool. Thanks, Amanda. So one of the um, things that often get overlooked is just to look at search query reports. Um, they Search query reports are actually a great way to not only look for your negative keywords, but also to reveal some new profitable keywords that you can add to your account. 
because it's more than likely that when you first build out your keyword list um, that you miss keywords that you could actually be using to improve your performance. So monitor, monitoring your search query report will allow you to see which keywords um, related to your products are getting a high search volume and are also already converting but are not in your account yet. So it's very easy to just add keywords. Um, once you've figured out which, um, on which keywords you want to run the search query report, just click on the keywords you want to add, tick the box next to the search term, and click them as add as, as, add as keyword. So search query reports can also give you a lot of insight into the type of language that the majority of people use when they're searching for your products. And this, with this information, you can also add your ads and your um, keyword lists to better match the language that is used by your audience, which should then result in uh, increased relevancy. And due to the huge amount of value that can be obtained from the search query reports, um, I would say or recommend that you monitor this information very closely and on a regular basis because it can result in consistent improvements in your campaigns and also in the end um, you can get a better business outcome. Um, a different way that I actually just learned about, it's also very interesting, is to think outside the box. So instead of just examining your top performing keywords in all of the available tools and reports to find new keywords, um, try to find new keywords or even keyword themes with um, lower competition. So some of these keywords might not convert, but it's a very low risk strategy for expanding your paid search efforts. And it's also really beneficial if it's executed well. So keywords with little or no competition tend to have low click uh, cost per clicks and they also tend to convert as well or even higher than highly competitive keywords so first of all think about the four common keyword types that are out there there are um, explicit keywords which directly describe the product there are problems keywords which describe the condition that a product solves there are symptoms keywords that describe the actual problem and then there are the product names and part numbers so once you organize your keywords um, like this, terms can be segmented into different ad groups as they represent also different types of the searches. So some people may think more in terms of products and others might think in terms of solutions or problems. So when you're looking at these keywords, they can tell you a story. And while it would be easier to see these stories once you have conducted the keyword research, instead create the scenarios beforehand and also use them to find new keywords. So instead of using the keyword tools, think about your products in terms of those four keyword types and also ask, your for, um, ask yourself the questions, what problems can your product solves, solve? Um, what creative solutions can you come up with? And also what symptoms appear to a consumer that your product will fix for them? And once you come up with a few simple stories around your keywords, you can then use these stor stories to see if you can find entirely new customers to reach. And that would be it for my tips. Perfect. Thanks, guys. So we're going to move on to the next interesting stat. And I just want to remind everyone at the end, there will be time for Q&A. So you can use the uh, chat function in GoToMeeting, send along your questions, and we'll do our best to answer as many of them as, as possible. So we're going to kind of keep moving through them, but don't hesitate to send along your questions. So the stat that we're going to look at next is uh, that a visitor from PPC Link is 50% more likely to result in a conversion than an organic visitor. So I'm sure a lot of SEO guys are rolling their head right now, uh, but it's good news for us. So um, kind of the question this raises is, how do you optimize your return on spend, your return on ad spend, to get as much as possible out of those PPC clicks since they're so valuable? And I'll let Amanda go through her tips. Yeah. So the first thing that um, I really stress is that a keyword converting under your return on ad spend goal is bad. So um, this is something that I struggle with with clients um, all the time. So for example, these are um, kind of fake keywords, but the real stats. Um, I just changed the keyword, so you can see that there 
if this account had a return on ad spend goal of two dollars and that was the break even point, you might see these keywords like cat post um, brought in a revenue of over eight thousand dollars. So that seems really great. But the return on ad spend goal of being under a dollar ninety eight, um, so below our goal, is losing money. Like it, it might not be losing a lot of money, but it's still losing money. So identifying keywords that are below your return on ad spend goal and changing them is really important. So obviously the 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 best way to do that, um, the first way to try and do that is to change the bid um, and see what you can get out of that. But if you can't get the return on ad spend to meet your goal with just bid management, then you could try making it longer tail. So like for cat posts, maybe I want to specify what kind of cat post. Maybe it is a really cool brand of cat post and I could specify that to have a better conversion rate. Maybe I could change the match type from broad match to phrase match or exact match to get a better return on ad spend or change the geotargeting. Sometimes just going through and playing with the geotargeting and Thinking maybe it's just the really high converting areas for cat posts will help make your return on ad spend better. Um, but I think it, it's often overlooked that even if the keyword is bringing in a lot of revenue and a lot of conversion, that the return on ad spend being below goal means you're losing money no matter what. Um, and also, increasing your quality score can decrease your cost per click for the same ad position. So um, when you think about trying to um, get within your return and ad spend goal or optimizing for the most profit. Looking at quality score um, can give you a lot of insight into where you have room for improvement. So I took a screenshot of this keyword that has a four out of 10 for quality score, so it's pretty low. And you can see that it says, it tells you exactly what's wrong. My expected click-through rate is below average, so I should really work on the click-through rate. And then I just put the little um, screen grab from the AdWords help section that shows the bid and quality score um, is what determines your ad rank. So if you have a higher conversion rate or probably a higher click-through rate and, and a higher ad position, but it's a little too pricey for you, you can try and really work on your quality score by uh, making your ad really re relevant, making sure that your landing page experience is really good, um, and then trying to increase your click-through rate by means other than um, increasing your bids and then seeing if that can get you a higher quality score, which should get you a higher ad rank um, for the same price. And Christina? Yes, so one tip that I have is look at or think about average position bidding. Uh, most advertisers might want to be in position one because they think that uh, in a higher position they are more likely to convert. But users actually compare your ads and also the websites and then um, see which advertiser is offer, offering the best deal for the product that they want to buy. Um, therefore, just don't waste your money and bid up every single keyword in your account just to show in position one. Um, instead, analyze the actual return that you're getting from your um, keywords in different average positions. And you can see this. Um, which you can then also see which average position leads to the highest conversion volume within your um, return on ad spend or CPA limits. So how do you do that? Um, just download your keyword report, either from a customer report and analytics that includes the revenue data, or run a dynamic conversion or have dynamic conversion tracking in AdWords um, pull the real revenue data for you. Um, then create a pivot table um, with your average position and add a sum for revenue and cost as well as a calculated field for revenue minus cost and then this report can show you where your keywords perform the best and you can adjust your bids appropriately. So let's say you have an, you find that the average position of 2.5 is the best for your conversion volume and revenue. You will then want to analyze your data to see what your average CPC is for that position and then adjust um, your bids until you start seeing that your keywords are in that position range. Another method um, to optimize your bids for return on ad spend is the value per click method. And with this method, you take the total value that's delivered by a keyword and divide it by the number of clicks for the keyword. Um, that helps you to compare the value per click number to your average CPC for that keyword. And then also you can see how your optimal 
your optimal um, current bit, what your optimal current bit is. Um, let's look at an example. So just download the keywords um, that you want to adjust your bits for. Can you go back, Jeff? And you can get a pretty decent idea of which keywords are making or losing money just by subtracting the total cost from the total conversion value. So make sure that you have the total conversion value in your reports. Um, this, however, doesn't get you much insight how you should change your bits. So to get to that, you'll need to add a value per click column that divides the total conversion volume, in this case, um, column L, by the total clicks, column C. Now um, you can actually see how much value each click is delivering and also how much this differs from the average cost per click. In our example, all of our keywords are making money on the average click, which is what you want to see. In the next example, um, we figure out how we, we want to adjust the bits. So we removed, in the next slide, um, we removed all the non-bit related metrics for clarity and also add an, another column. And this column is the value per click cost per click, which is just the um, value per click minus the average CPC. So in this case, if your value per click CPC is negative, you then want to adjust your bits down. Um, and vice versa, like if you're, in our case, the value per click CPC is positive, so you might want to consider bidding up um, to make even more money on your keywords. Um, in our case, when we look at the keywords, we are in a position um, of around four for the personalized easy gifts. So we might want to try to increase the bits um, and see if that increases the traffic and also the conversions while we still remain profitable for the keywords. So this method can actually give you an indication of how much you can increase the bit. And when you want to make money on PPC, you absolutely have to look at the revenue and also the profit that's driven by each keyword. And that's all the tips I have. Okay, thanks again, guys. Um, really quick question for you, Christina. When you're talking about value per click and deciding whether or not you think you should change the bit, is average position the main indicator? So if you have a good value per click, you're positive, it seems like you should up the bit. Is that the secondary metric you look at or do you look at something else? Um, I look at average position just to see like, if I'm in, already in position one, I don't think there's much need to bid up more. Um, but I also look at um, revenue just to see if, if it's worth to um, and the actual revenue data and analytics just to see if there's um, more ways that I can should bid up because at one point um, the keyword is going to reach the optimal revenue or the highest revenue that it can get so um, always take everything into consideration. Okay, makes sense, thank you. Uh, so our next uh, interesting stat that we're going to talk about is PPC brand impressions that occur through both social media and search engine results increase click-through rates by 94%. Um, so social media tells a, a different strategy than pure search PPC. Sites like Facebook, Pinterest are very image heavy, Twitter and LinkedIn are text and news based. So how do you find the right mix when you're running PPC simultaneously on social and search engine platforms? Uh, I'll let Amanda start with her tips. Yeah, so uh, obviously the easy answer is that the right mix depends on what results you're getting. Um, but you can try and predict that um, by what type of product you're selling. So you really want to put your efforts where you see the best return in volume. And in my experience, I've seen that Pinterest is really great for fashion-based products and that Facebook is really great for social-based products. So I actually have a client that um, has fashion-based products that are also sort of a marker of a social class or a social sort of um, situation where people um, really want to show off this sort of thing. So looking at that, uh, you can see in analytics by traffic source what the revenue is. Um, and you can see if you have organic stats for this before you decide to start doing any kind of marketing or advertising on these sort of platforms and see what just organically is happening. So people sharing links on your from your site on their Facebook or pinning your stuff on Pinterest and people coming from there to convert on your page. And you can see um, for this particular person or client that Facebook is doing pretty well from them, 
from uh, $2,600 and that Pinterest is doing pretty well too for $1,600. So seeing those kinds of results, um, you can try and figure out, um, see the visits and, and figure out the revenue per visit and what you might want to spend on that. Um, and if you don't have, if you're not uh, a site that's big enough to have a lot of organic referral traffic like that, then you might just want to try and think about um, how people would be interested in your products. If it's a fashion base, like I said, that would be really good for Pinterest. Very visual products do really well on Pinterest, and, and, and Facebook does really well for social-based products. So just trying to think out the strategy behind how people interact with your products and where they might share them should lead you to uh, a good assumption on where you should try to do some social advertising. And Christina, I will let you get to your tips. All right, thanks, Amanda. So I think that we've been all told multiple times now that social media will change the way that people shop because the recommendations that you're getting from your friends on a social media page carries more weight than results from a search engine. However, as you can see in the graphic, um, social is still drives far less traffic than search. Like in this graphic, search has 34% and social only 2%. Um, this is just due to the fact that users mostly turn to search as a discovery platform versus social when they're actually searching or um, searching to buy products. And people on social media are there to socialize, while people on, use mostly uh, search engines to actually find the products they're looking for and do the research on the products. Um, Facebook and Twitter are actually making some efforts to change this by Facebook introducing the Facebook graph search and Twitter enabling instant commerce, commerce with American Express, but still um, social right now is mostly used for brand development and as a customer service listening platform. This being said though, social should, should still have a place in the marketer's toolbox. So let's see, what can you do as a marketer? <coughs> like. The online marketing channels are very competitive and therefore it's really important to use intelligent strategies to get the most out of your time and money. And one of the most effective ways to ensure a high performance for your overall marketing efforts is to also make sure that your different channels are set up in ways that complement each other. Because you, the individual internet user will most likely come across your advertising in um, all sides, sorts of places on the internet. So first of all, you have to identify your goals and then weigh your budgets accordingly. Like, do you wanna drive more sales or do you wanna um, raise your brand awareness? In my ex experience, I think um, social media right now is mostly used to build brand awareness. So although paid search might um, still drive more sales, it's equally important to focus on the social channels because you can talk to people about your product, you can introduce new product, you can do product research, and therefore it's important to build a grand, great fan base so you get that feedback from your customers. Um, first step is for all the business should be to promote your business to get your name out there and build that brand aware awareness on social media. So, and once you have a great fan base, you can then also get the insights um, from, this, from the different social media platforms to create more better targeted ads towards your followers, um, be it um, with the demographics or targeted to gen, uh, age, um, geographies, it's, you can all see that on the social channels um, once you have enough <coughs> fans or followers. And then you can also um, see which products or categories are best suited to be promoted on the different social media channels according to the insights you're getting. So once you have the different channels um, set up and you have that fan base, you have to make sure that you have consistent messaging across all your marketing channels. This will help you to create credibility for your selling point. So whether it's a text ad on Google or a social media ad on Facebook or Pinterest, it is important that you are consistent across the board. Use the same call to actions, use the same um, discounts or offers 
um, make sure that it's it's all aligned. And another way is to you should use the different channels to engage the users, and you can do that by either have, um, having contests that refer from your social media channels to your website, or you have contests on your website that refer back to the social media channels. And also make sure that no matter if it's a text ad or an image ad, that when you promote something, have coupons, sales, offers in your ad. Um, to get more people to come to your site or your social media channels to find out more about your products and your business. That's all I had. Okay, perfect. So uh, we got a quick question on Twitter that I think it makes sense to address now. Uh, I'll ask Amanda. Um, so someone asked why we use one per click instead of many per click. We typically do use many per click. Wouldn't you agree with Matt? With that, Amanda? Yeah, I, I don't think that I have any e-com clients that I use one per click. But I will say that um, a, a lot of times if you're just downloading a report, it could be just the um, default. And if you're just looking at revenue and cost numbers and not so much conversion numbers, that it would, might be something that you don't pay attention to on that sort of report. So that makes sense. If you're looking at revenue by keyword, it doesn't matter if it's one per click or many per click, it's revenue. Makes sense, thank you. Um, so then the next stat that we're gonna move on to here is companies with 30 plus landing pages generate seven X more leads than companies with less than five or seven X more sales. Um, so I, I wonder if that's a, a sign of them being larger companies and having more resources and pumping more money into their budgets or if going to that level of granularity with the landing page really does make a, a difference. So the questions are: is here, what are some landing page and CRO tips uh, that have helped your account so other people can realize this kind of performance gain. So I'll let Amanda take it away. Uh, yeah, so I think that basically you should have a landing page for each product type and for my tips I used um, what I think is a really great e-commerce website which is the e-commerce website for the limited and being a girl who wears um, that kind of clothes I can tell you that it is one of my favorite sites to shop on so I use it as an example. Um, so you can see here that they have a landing page for pretty much every type of item that they sell. So if someone's looking specifically for a cami, they have a landing page for that. They have a landing page for shirts and blouses. They have a landing page for knit tops and tees. And so this really allows you to think of all the different ways that people are searching for your products and have a landing page set up for them and have ads and ad groups set around those keywords because to some people a knit top and a cami might be the same thing and other people that could be super different things. So having um, landing pages set up around the types of keywords that people are searching for will really help you be super granular and um, get the most of your money and have really great quality scores. And then on that note, uh, making sure that you can people can search by cost or popularity, reviews, um, what's new and etc. Uh, make sure that's super easy if you have a large inventory. So like on the limited Theirs is super great. It's one of my favorites. Like I said, um, you can search by size, you can search by color of item, you can search by the price range, you can search by the sleeve length, and then when you get to exactly what you want, so maybe I'm looking for an orange size small under $25 with three four sleeve length, I can then sort by the newest, the highest rated, and the pricing. So, I mean, you it makes it as easy as possible to find what you're looking for and that's a really important thing. If you have a vast majority or a vast inventory on your item or on your website then it's really hard to find what you're looking for if you don't offer these sorts of um, sorting mechanisms. I know that I've spent hours trying to find something on a website to later find that it was there and I just wasn't searching for it the correct way so um, you basically just want to make sure that you're making it as easy as possible for people to get to your page, find what they want, and then to buy it. So um, for CRO, I think that it's really the user, user uh, ability test. You want people um, who've never been to your site to check it out, ask them to look for a certain item and see how long it takes them and see if they get frustrated finding it. And then you'll know whether or not you need to up your CRO game. And then I'll let Christina get into more in depth about CRO issues. Yeah, thanks Amanda. So <clears throat> you always have to think about that a landing page is the first impression for a visitor 
and the visitor decides within a five second window if they're going to stay on the page or leave. So visitors should feel that the message from the directing source, which is hopefully your ad, is also continued on the landing page. For example, if you advertise a 20% off coupon in an ad, your landing page must also offer the same discount. So landing pages should be unique and targeted and that is have unique content and targeted content that is really relevant to your ad and also speaks about the product that is advertised. So there needs to be a strong message match that tells the customer that he's definitely in the right place to buy the product from your store. So keep the overall look for your landing pages focused and simple. Use original content that focuses on a single topic, preferably matching the words and also the phrases that are used in your ad. So <clears throat> a good landing page includes a variety of content. Um, first of all, it should have a unique selling proposition. It should have a compelling overview of your product, explain what your product is, what it does, um, list all the features and benefits of your product, and even use rich media to showcase when you're the product in use with either video or photo. Um, also use testimonials. Have other um, customers talk about the product, how they used it, why they bought it, what they think about it and have a seductive call to action. You have to tell the customers what you want them to do next. Do you want them to buy the product, place an order, or download something from your page? Um, another way, like once you actually have a good landing page, um, what gets overlooked is the checkout process. The checkout process should be really easy and also fast to navigate for a customer. So once you have ensured that all the concerns and questions of the, of the customer are answered and that the goal is achieved that they actually want to buy the product from your page, it is a must that you ensure that the order links are easy to find. So let's look at an example. With Easter being around the corner, I was looking for Easter bunnies and I came to this landing page and look at that add to cart order links easy to find so what happens next once I click on that button next slide please I'll get to the shopping cart on this card I can see what's actually in my shopping cart what's if I want to use a discount co uh, code and I can either continue shopping or check out in this case I just wanted the Easter Bunny now I can check out so when I hit that button, I can see that next screen, which is explains also that it's a three steps that you need to complete the checkout. And what they, in this case, what they did is also really neat that you can either sign in directly as a returning customer to make it easy for the checkout or just use as a guest checkout. Um, next slide. So let's, uh, let's say you are a guest and you want to continue. Step two of three is the shipping information. And it has the bill to and ship to, so you fill out the form once. And it's pretty easy if you just have the same address as the bill to, um, want it shipped to the same address, and you just click that little box. Also very neat, they have the gift options on the page if you want to include them, and they tell you exactly about uh, the shipping options you have. Not only how much it's going to be, but also the approximate delivery. And very important, there's only one step you can take to hit the next button. There's no back button. So once you click on the next button, you get to step three, and it gives you the order summary so you can see what you actually bought, if everything's correct, look over your address again, and then fill out your payment options and again here the call to action place the order simple and you're ready to check out so that was very easy a very fast checkout I don't have any questions I can review my order and make sure that everything's correct so one more thing that I would suggest for e-commerce 
pages is to have a really um, easy and good reliable site search functionality because it not only helps the cust customers to easily navigate your site and find the products that they're looking for, but you as the retailer can also use them to or use it to get more insights um, when you have analytic solutions and it also helps to make um, intelligent optimization choices. So let's say there's a specific term that gets searched over and over again on your site, then you should, you should, you should think about adding that term to your keywords in your account or even if you don't have already um, design a product landing page for that term. So these are my tips for e-commerce pages and I give it back to Jeff. Perfect. Thank you very much. So we've hit the end of our uh, our tips. So um, just kind of wrapping that up, start with search. Your customers do, even though the social is still an option. A lot of the traffic's coming from search. Optimize for return on ad spend. It's one of the benefits that e-commerce managers have. It's probably one of the things that we like most about e-commerce and sometimes least because you can't hide from your results. You know every dollar you spent, how much you made in revenue. Um, reconsider your PPC ad mix. Brand impressions are more valuable in multiple channels, um, so don't forget about that. And multiply your landing pages. More is better, but effective is best. So uh, if you have the resources uh, to duplicate landing pages and make sure you give each one of them effort, uh, attention, and can personalize them and make them specific to what the, the ad says and all that, that's going to get you the best uh, results in the end. Uh, so we're going to jump in. We have a couple questions. You guys do still have some time uh, to send along your questions, but we had a couple housekeeping ones. Um, so the first is, this is for you, Christina. Someone asked, is value per click the same as revenue per click? Um, value per click is not the same as um, revenue per click. Revenue is the actual um, profit that you have, while the value is just um, giving you the idea of um, how valuable your keywords actually are. But you should look, um, revenue is the real number that you should look at in the end. Um, value is just giving you an idea within the AdWords interface to see um, how a quick look how valuable your keywords actually are. Okay, thank you. And then Amanda, there was a question about quality score. Um, I'll make it a two-parter. So the bigger picture part was what's the best way to increase campaign quality score? That's a pretty broad question, so I'll let you talk a little bit about it. But the more specific question along with that is you mentioned if you have low expected click-through rate, for example, you're going to want to write new ads, get click-through rate, but how long does it typically take after you write some better ads and increase click through rate to actually realize the results in, in uh, quality score? Um, so the best way to increase campaign quality score, I would say, is to segment, segment, and then segment some more. So I take over a lot of accounts um, where it's kind of a hodgepodge and there's a lot of keywords that aren't necessarily really related to each other. So in the same ad group, and you'll see that ad groups suffer from low quality score. So trying to find um, the tightest group that you can think of for your product. So if you have, for instance, tents, you want to think of brands of tents, you want to think of types of tents, you want to think of color of tents, and try and make as many subcategories as possible for your ad groups. Having the tightest knit group of 